Welcome to Unmasking Humanity 21 Questions with Joshua T. Berglund. I'm your host, Joshua. Thank you all so much for being here today. Today, we have Philip Bramwell, who is an amazing human being. Um, I would have never known, ever, that he had cerebral palsy, ever. Uh, getting to know him over the last few weeks, I would have never known at all. Um, but I just absolutely one of the most special humans that I've ever met. And Philip Bramwell is here today to answer some really challenging but interesting questions. And I got to tell you, all of his answers blew me away. Um, I just finished the interview and I mean, it's awesome. Uh, if you If you love somebody with a disability, this broadcast is for you. If you're somebody with a disability of any kind, mental or physical, I, mean, I think there's probably emotional disabilities too. Um, this broadcast is for you. If you're somebody that's lonely, this broadcast is for you. Um, I love it. I loved it. This is one of my favorite broadcasts I've ever done. And mainly, even though I expected it to be good because I have seen Philip in action, uh, and I, we talk about that in this interview, with how I know him and how this all came to be. But it exceeded my expectations um, by far. And Philip's a real talent. And I hope even regardless of the disability that he deals with and thrives with, uh, the sky is the limit for him. And I hope and pray that um, I, I, I just, I, I maybe I'm, I'm kind of stumbling over my words here because I don't want to wish something on someone that they may not want themselves. But I, I truly foresee Philip being a voice for the voiceless all over the world. And I see him being a, a talking head, a, an expert in his field. But the, his message, uh, his words, his way of being, it's, it's something that you know, I think is good for all of us to be around. And uh, his advocacy work is something that has just lit a fire in me. Um, but again, his attitude, his way of being, his confidence is just something that like, I, I can't get it. I couldn't get enough being around him today. Like I kept asked, I asked more than 21 questions for the record because there was just so much to talk about. Philip's awesome. Uh, this is again, one of my favorite, I've done probably 700 interviews now and uh this is easily easily in the top three and it's incredible you guys are going to be blessed from this so thank you for being here as i said my name is joshua and i'm the host of unmasking humanity 21 questions with joshua t berglund thank you for being here you can find the world's mayor experience platform where this is being broadcast on of course you're probably seeing clips and other things all over the place but uh, we self-host, and you can go to our platform at joshuatberglund.com. There's all kinds of education, a bunch of different videos, podcasts. Uh, there's multiple podcasts, books, and so much more. So go check it out. Thank you for being here. But I got to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, you're in for a treat. So please welcome Mr. Philip Bramwell to Unmasking Humanity, 21 Questions with Joshua T. Berglund. And we're back to Unmasking Humanity, 21 Questions with Joshua T. Berglund. And ladies and gentlemen, you are in for a treat. This is going to be so awesome. And I got to tell you, I know I talked about this a little bit in the intro, but I got to know our guest, Philip Bramwell, through his videos. Um, I was able to watch several of his videos. Actually, it was, it was a video, but it was turned into multiple little videos. And one of the things that I got to see in Philip that was so encouraging to me was his confidence and his belief in himself. And when you get to know him here shortly, um, you're going to see why that means so much to me. I am, I, I've heard that Philip doesn't like the word inspired, so I don't know another word. My vocabulary is not that rich, but I will say this. I've never in my life encountered somebody that it was like just watching them through a camera. I thought he was like my brother. I, 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 I related to him. I admire his courage. I admire his strength. And I'll also admire 
his passion for truth and being authentic. And it's so welcome to me. And I think the world needs more of what Philip has to offer. And so, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to get to see a little bit about why I admire Philip so much through these 21 questions. And this is going to be a lot of fun. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome the one, the only, Mr. Philip Bramwell. Philip, how you doing, man? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me on, Joshua. I'm very excited to have you here. This is going to be a lot of fun. And these 21 questions are challenging, but I think they're going to be fun for you to answer. But before we get into all that, can you tell me, what are you grateful for today and why? Uh, well, I'm in a wheelchair. I use a manual wheelchair full time for mobility. And so my wheelchair is an essential part of my life. Uh, it functions as my legs because I'm, I'm not able to walk uh, with my legs. So I'm grateful for my durable medical equipment uh, that helps me function in daily life uh, on a daily basis. And in general, I'm just grateful for the medical attention and knowledge that I've received uh, through my circumstance. So I've suffered a lot, but I've also learned a lot through my suffering. And so I'm grateful for that. That's awesome gratitude. In fact, I worked with complex disabilities for a long time. And, you know, I've got to see all kinds of different stories. I mean, I've seen quadriplegics that became skydiving Elvises. And I've seen quadriplegics, you know, be become succumbed to addiction where, you know, they really struggled, battled with addiction and battled with worthiness issues. And not saying you're a quadriplegic, but what I am saying is, having been around that industry for so many years, I've seen a lot of stories. And so when I said to you, and I know you don't like the word, but inspired, it's because of your attitude and your way of being. And it's really, really exciting because when I see people like yourself, you're defying the odds. And yet at the same time, you're moving forward as if there is no disability. You march forward confidently as if there is no disability or obstacles in your way. And for someone like myself, that really ignites my passion for life. So I want to thank you for that. That is my gratitude for you today. Oh, thank you so much for those words, Joshua. It means a lot. All right. Are you ready for your ready. questions? Let's do it. <laughs> All right. As, as a triplet with a unique medical diagnosis, how did your relationship with your siblings shape your perspective on life? Uh, well, my brother and my sister were triplets, uh, but they're not uh, in a wheelchair with cerebral palsy like me. They're able-bodied. And so my brother and my sister, they always treated me normal as if I was not disabled. A little bit too normal, I like to say. Sometimes, you know, I took, you know, a couple whoopings and, and uh, you know, they were pretty rough on me, uh, but it toughened me up. And, you know, I'm grateful for them and the way that they treated me. Equal opportunity, as I like to say, uh, to help me uh, function better as an independent adult. That is awesome. That is such a good answer. And an unexpected, unexpected answer also. All right. Question two. I just lost it on my dadgum screen. Screensaver, stop it. Okay. Sorry about that. My goodness. All right. Number two. Can you share a memorable moment from your time as a childhood actor and model that influenced your curtain path? Um, yes. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about the actual jobs themselves, but the classes I used to take as a child. Uh, I was enrolled in an acting academy. So these individuals who we were all children and we were all on a path and desired to be like uh, big Hollywood a actors and models. And so I really appreciated those experiences because I was with people that were in like advanced placement classes and uh, just uh, in, in smart, intelligent world uh, environments. And when you're disabled, you're kind of isolated in those environments unless you figure out a way to get out of that. So I was really grateful for those uh, experiences. That That's neat. And, you know, when I was looking at your, you know, watching your videos and um, 
I kept messaging your mom going, man, he's got a look like you've got it. You've got the it factor. And you, and so now knowing that you've actually modeled and acted like it makes sense, but literally you have, a, you have the look, you have the look of somebody that is belongs on TV. And again, the more people hear you talk, the more they're going to go, this dude has something to say that we need to listen to. So I, I, it, it makes me happy to know that you actually have a background in this because I believe that your background in this is going to fuel your purpose moving forward. Uh, that experience is, was not an accident and it sure as heck uh, wasn't wasted. So it's cool to hear that. Thank you. All right. Next question. How did participating in adaptive wheelchair sports impact your self-perception and confidence? Um, so wheelchair sports, uh, it's, it's designed for people in wheelchairs, uh, people that are more severe than me, less severe than me, and equally severe. And so I learned um, from a young age um, to model good behaviors. I also learned uh, the bad behaviors that uh, disabled people do. And so you can kind of discern uh, the good from bad. And I try to emulate the behaviors that were good. And I try to avoid the behaviors that I saw that were not so good. Um, that also includes the way that parents treated their kids. Uh, there were some parents that were helicopter type of parents and other parents, you know, were like, figure, figure it out. And so um, you can kind of see a correlation between how people were treated and how they turned out. That is so good. And this question's not planned, but you, there was something that you said that sparked this re remind or this memory of compliance versus thinking outside of the box. And so knowing your mother and knowing how she is about compliance, of course, being a medical doctor, and then knowing yourself that obviously you had to be somewhat compliant to be able to progress this far and to continue to be as able-bodied as you are. But at the same time, there's also the outside of the box thinking that helps people get to where they want to go to, that helps them heal or helps them have a breakthrough or improve or do more of their daily living activities that they were limited from before. So from your perspective, because one thing I also notice about you is that you know how to advocate for yourself. And people that know how to advocate for themselves are also not only rule followers, but they're also going to think outside of the box too, because sometimes you have to think outside of the box to be able to advocate for yourself. So in your situation, from your perspective, can you talk a bit about that balance between being compliant to what the doctors and the therapists say versus knowing yourself and saying, well, I think that this would actually help me, not that. Can you talk about that? Uh, well, I'll, I'll frame it from when I was a child. Uh, when I was a child, you know, it was it was much more simple to just listen to what the adults said because that ha because that's what happens for everybody. If you're a child, you're programmed to listen to the adults. So as a as a child, it's more um, normal or socially acceptable. But one interesting thing about uh, my pediatric therapy experiences where they uh, our therapists didn't encourage therapists didn't encourage talking back and being rebellious but when but when it happened they kind of um, they, they kind of understood where it came from because they knew deep down that for us for people like me to have a successful life we're gonna have to have that, that edge a little bit of a of a resistance to not being too passive. So even though they didn't want us to talk back and they had to discipline us a few times, uh, the talking back, you know, they they didn't discourage it because they knew that that was gonna be a key part of our survival growing up. They were right about that. That's awesome. That's such a good answer. Very good. Next question. Uh, you're killing it, man. I, I, I really do love these answers. They're really fun. What drew you to experimenting with drums and how has music played a role in your life? Um, so the reason I uh, attempted to play the, the drums was simply because it was something that my body um, could handle. And so I tried to 
um, play the drums. Uh, I, I wanted to join my school's, you know, uh, band. Um, they had, you know, some school districts have music programs available. I wanted to do that. Um, it didn't work out in that regard, but I wanted to try to do it. And music, uh, I'm not a huge music guy. I, I like music. It's a good distraction. Um, but the reason I tried to play the drums was simply because it was something out that was a, within my wheelhouse. But as we'll, we might talk about, acting and modeling became my main uh, activity when I was a child. Very cool. Can you describe a pivotal, pivotal? <laughs> I can't. <laughs> 45 years old and you think I know how to talk. Hold on a second. <clears throat> Pardon me. Can you describe a pivotal moment when you realize the importance of educating others about your condition? Uh, yes. Uh, so I actually learned this uh, very, very young. Um, I grew up around children. Some of them were nonverbal. So nonverbal means that they cannot talk. Of course, the communication is different. You can communicate with body language. So I'm simply talking about the verbal aspect. And so I grew up around some kids that were nonverbal, and I could see a difference in how they were treated um, differently, not in a good way, uh, compared to people that could talk. And so that was one reason why I recognized the importance of that. And then the second to that was um, if you're physically disabled, you're not going to be able to outmuscle your way through a situation. You're going to have to outthink and out communicate your way through the difficulties. Um, so I learned very young that my communication skills were going to be essential to my uh, survival and, and ability to thrive as an adult. That makes so much sense after again like barely knowing you but just watching you watching you communicate it's powerful like i again i don't even <clears throat> you like when you're think when you're going through the process of learning how to be an effective communicator and you you talked about the reason why the, the understanding of like you need to be a good communicator to to, to be able to do the things that you want. What would you say was the biggest challenge in learning how to communicate effectively the way that you have? Like wh what kind of rough spots were there and how did you overcome them? Oh, yes, uh, the roughest spot was uh, part of my cerebral palsy is that I have a, it's called dysarthria. So it's part of the brain injury, uh, which causes uh, disruption to my vocal cords. Uh, so I used to have, uh, a more severe speech impediment than I do now. Um, and I had some swallowing difficulties when I was young. So simply the ability to talk, um, to speak, uh, it was difficult because I had to develop my vocal muscles and my uh, vocal cords to, to accommodate my disability. I, that was a personal reason why I asked that question. Um, again, it wasn't a planned question, but I, I appreciate that answer. As you can see, that my head is starting to move more <laughs> than it was when we started. And uh, one of the things that happens is it affects my speech. And when that happens, for me, because I've been paid for my voice, like that's how I earn money is my voice, <laughs> or one of the ways. And having that affected was very disheartening heartening for me and a struggle. And so my, my asking you that question was really a curiosity for a personal reason, because I'm looking for ways to keep my speech from being affected that way. So I, I look to people like yourself as, as like a guide because you know, the doctors aren't much help right now for me. So I'm having to find innovative ways to heal. So I appreciate that answer. Thank you. Um, oh, I, I love this question. I hope you do too. How has living with cerebral palsy influenced your problem solving skills and adaptability? Oh, yes. Uh, with having uh, cerebral palsy, 
uh, there, there, there are constant problems, uh, more problems than I can even talk about in one interview, but there are so many problems, but I'm a good problem solver to the extent where I can see a problem before it happens and be more proactive about it and try to eliminate or reduce the, the negative impact. Whereas, you know, if you're not used to having problems, you might be more reactive and just wait for something uh, bad to happen. But for me, I'm a very proactive person. And so I've learned how to, um, how to manage problems to either remove them or reduce the impact. That's a really good advice. What inspired you to focus on educating pediatric medical professionals about childhood experiences with chronic conditions? Oh, yes. Uh, so when I was a child, I received very good um, medical education. Um, but as I, when I grew up, um, nobody followed up with me. Or, and we typically don't get followed up on as adults um, to see how it went, what mistakes were done. And so because of social media, it's, it's uh, easier to see what's going on with the, the children today with disabilities. And I became a little bit disturbed of seeing repeated uh, mistakes and errors happening, but nobody was asking us uh, what, what we thought about our treatment in, in reflection. Um, so it's become a, a huge passion of mine. And you're really good at it too. Can you share an example of an unrecognized medical error you've encountered and how it shaped your advocacy work? Oh, yes. Uh, so for cerebral palsy, one of the main um, problems uh, that people with my condition have is uh, we have hip dislocation issues. And oh. so when you're a kid, uh, when you're a child, they try to make us, uh, they try to to do like exercises and help us walk. Uh, some people are able to walk and some people aren't, depending on what section of, the, of your brain uh, was impaired. Um, but my point is that um, there's a lot of people that walk too much and walk with poor form. And so it's pretty much a guarantee that we're going to have hip problems. The way that uh, walking and the way that uh, the way that uh, walking and balance is, is taught is a guarantee for hip problems, and so I want to try to prevent uh, children from going through unnecessary hip surgeries. Uh, and the way that I want to do that is by teaching um, better ways and better ways to manage uh, walking and learning how to walk. That, that's pretty brilliant, actually. And, I, and I've never, I, I've never thought about that before. Um, another unplanned question, but do the standing devices, you know, they have sit to stand or there's easy stand, there's that company, and then they have the standing mobility chairs, standing power wheelchairs. Would, would do you, in your opinion, I, I, and I don't know if you know this or not, but in your opinion, do you think those types of mobility and assistive devices help people with cerebral palsy avoid hip problems? Uh, I do think that they're helpful for alignment, um, but they but they cause a problem in another way that people don't really talk about. And that is, let's say you're in your standing frame, mm -hmm. uh, you're usually doing your homework or doing some other activity as a distraction but you're probably not doing your homework as good as you could be doing it because you're you're in pain and you're you're uh, stressed out about the standing. And so the, even though you're standing in the standing frame and you're doing a good job in that regard, um, you're probably faltering in the in the other areas that are important. Yeah. And I think education uh, is something that shouldn't be sacrificed uh, for. A standing frame, for example. Thank you for that. How do you approach creating content for your Instagram and YouTube pages 
to effectively reach and support newly disabled individuals? Oh, well, where I live, um, there's a lot of um, disabled individuals that I know of. I would say they're acquaintances rather than friends, um, but I have a good, good network where I live. And so that's a, a starting point. And then on, online, I'm not the only disability influencer. There's uh, many other people and also parents that are starting to do it on behalf of their disabled children. Um, so it's easy to identify uh, the, the trends and the problems that are happening. Mm -hmm. So my, my growth is still emerging, but uh, I hope to combine, um, I, I know how to identify the problems and I just need the, an audience big enough uh, to hear what I have to say. Um, but that's how I identify problems. There's people in my community and then uh, social media made a big difference. In, in this regard as well. If I may, one, one thing that I experienced again through watching your videos is that you're not just a voice for other people with disabilities. You're an, you're, a, you're an advocate for those that love people with disabilities because you're teaching them, you're holding people accountable, you're, you're speaking up for yourself, you're being your own voice. And I, I mean, again, you, you're a, masterfully your therapist the way that you were working with your therapist you were incredible to watch and like i can totally see you speaking on stages all over the world talking to parents talking to caregivers talking to doctors talking to therapists and educating them on how to properly work with those with disabilities like your message is far beyond those to the dis dis disabled community like it, it it's universal to me so i i i say that and I, again i know that you you speak directly to those with disabilities but from my perspective and what i saw you speak to a lot more than that i agree with that good i'm glad you do <laughs> i really am because i have not that you asked but i have major expectations for you because you have all the talent, you've got the look, you've got the voice, you've got the communication skills, you got what it takes. So the sky's the limit for you. Oh, thank right. you so much, I agree. <laughs> I'm glad you agree. What's the most challenging aspect of living with cerebral palsy that you wish more people understood? So I'm not gonna, uh, I've, I've uh, managed and dealt with the medical side of my condition um, pretty well. So I know people would expect me to say, like, oh, it's probably because you can't walk or something like that, but I'm gonna go in another direction. And that would be that being disabled is very, very expensive. Um, it it uh, adds significant uh, stress to my financial well-being uh, for various reasons. And also, the, the government puts uh, caps on people with disabilities in terms of their income and assets. And so our ability to progress and to have generational wealth, for example, is significantly um, impeded. And so financially, it's very difficult to be disabled. Oh, my God. Gosh, I am so glad you brought this up because I understand this process of being on disability myself. They, if you go on disability, they they want you to die in disability, or like literally, if you make if you go out and earn any amount of money, you're at risk of losing your disability. But yet, the disability amount they give you is not enough to be able to wipe your butt with, much less have a home food, clothing, healthcare, and so on. It is the strangest process. Like it's a, it's a, it's a weird slave system. They don't want you to leave it. Even if you're on welfare, like they, if you make any amount of money, you don't get your welfare, but so you have no real opportunity to get on the other side of poverty. The whole system is like rigged against you. And so while it's, you could say, well, I'm just grateful for anything I get. 
But the problem is, if you have any ambitions for more than that, you're penalized for it. And then what happens if you have one or two months of doing well, and then you have a setback with your disability, but then you've lost your benefits, and then you got to go through the process and fight again. I mean, there's a lot of different examples, but that whole system is messed up. Again, not a planned question, but in your, from your perspective, I have my own opinion on this, but from your perspective, what's the solution to that problem? It's, it's complicated because everyone has a different um, philosophy as to work. Um, but I, I grew up with my disability. I was born with it. So I always knew that I wanted to support myself, have a wife, uh, maybe kids, you know, pets, and all that. And I always knew that required money. So it was never in my plans when I was a kid. Oh, I'm, I'm going to just apply to the Social Security office and uh, just ride out my life in that fashion. I always knew I need to get a career path uh, that would be sustainable so that I could support myself and support my uh, family, my developed family, and uh, at the same time, not put pressure on my parents and uh, you know older family members to take care of me. I wanted to be financially uh, sufficient. Um, and so, it, a lot of it has to do with what your what your philosophy is for your life. Like some people don't don't mind not working because they don't really expect too much of themselves. But if you do expect something of yourself, then then being on social security won't be uh, satisfactory for you. So the solution would be it's too complicated. I, I don't know if I have a solution right now. But it's a there's a difference in philosophy with the people that work versus the people that don't work. Because yeah, you can you can not work and you'll get maybe some money, but then you're always uh, slave to the government. You know, they could turn off your social security check at any time. They could say that you're doing fraud. They could say any number of things. And so I want to have control over my life. The only way I can have control over my life is I have to put it in the work, even if it's a little bit harder, harder of a path. Such a good answer. Such a good answer. All right, next question. How has your experience as a child actor helped you in your current role as an educator and an advocate? Oh, yes. Uh, so as an actor and a model, actually all childhood actors, not just disabled childhood actors, we're treated like adults. Um, we're treated like adults because we're in adult situations. Uh, we get paid money uh, for work, which is one of the one of the only ways that children are allowed to make money uh, is uh, in the entertainment business. And so we're around adults. Uh, we're treated like adults, and we're also expected to have good grades and uh, keep our keep our life together. And so. We were treated like adults when we were young. And so for disability education, it was a seamless transition because I've already been treated uh, to be a good speaker and a responsible person since I was a young boy. So everything just transitioned very smoothly. Very good, very good. What strategies have you developed to navigate environments that aren't fully accessible? Oh, yes. Um, a lot of this has to do with the, prepar the preparation uh, that happens before you get to a place. So let's say um, the bathroom. If I don't know if the bathroom is accessible where I'm going, well, that just means I won't be eating or drinking uh, before I go just to see before I see what the bathroom situation is. And if the bathroom is not accessible or I deem it unsafe for myself, then I might have to reduce my eating or drinking for that particular event. Or if it is accessible, then I just relax and do it as I planned. But the point is that you have to prepare accordingly and not get sloppy. It's about paying attention and adjusting uh, on the fly as you need to. That's actually really good advice for me. Huh. Thank you for that. I'm going to apply that to my own life. 
That's a good answer. All right. How do you balance self-care and advocacy work, especially given the importance of paying attention to your health? Um, so I have my own, I have my own issues like everybody does, even if you're not disabled. So of course, my loyalty is to my own dealing with my own problems, trying to come up with solutions. But I also see that if if I'm able to help my community, uh, my disabled community and their problems, uh, it's a in, in in its own way, it's helping me deal with my own problems because a lot of the problems they go through are the same that I go through. And so it's it's actually one and the same helping with my problems and helping with their problems. Um, so I, I don't view it separately. I view it as the same uh, concept. Beautiful. Can you share a story of how your advocacy has directly impacted someone's life or medical care? Uh, yes. Uh, it, um, it was actually this uh, this video that you worked on when I did that seminar. Um, they weren't planning on paying. They weren't planning on paying us uh, for that uh, for that work. Um, but I was the only one that spoke up about it, and so I got uh, what was supposed to be free work uh, and got it turned into paid work, and it actually got acknowledged by a particular individual. Um, and I helped multiple people get paid, but they that wasn't the plan initially, but it was because I spoke up that um, it got changed. That's so awesome. That's so awesome. By the way, do you have an IMDB page? I do. There you go. Very good. I actually need that link, by the way. <laughs> I give I give IMDB credits for all my guests. And uh and it's very important. Like in fact, I'm gonna break the third wall here. Uh anyone who has a podcast or does a live stream or anything like that should have their content registered on IMDB. You should have a profile for yourself as an individual, and you should also have um for all your work, anything you create. And it's very, very important. I won't go into a sermon about it right now, but I love that you have an IMDB page. It's super, super important, especially moving forward. And this is a great segue to the next question. What role do you think media plays in shaping perceptions of disabilities and how would you like to see that change? Oh, yes, uh, media plays a huge factor in how uh, disability is, is uh, seen in society. Uh, one key area that I see of mistake that the media makes is people getting, if they were, let's say they were in a car accident and they're in their rehab facility uh, practicing walking with like a harness or a walker, the media will frame that as, oh, so-and-so learned how to walk again. When in reality, they're doing they're, they're doing lower body exercises, which is valuable in itself. But to say that it's walking uh, is, a, is untruthful. I mean, I understand there's SEO and other factors there. They're, they're trying to get clicks. Uh, but I, I'm just speaking from the truthful, truthfulness of those type of stories. There's a lot of um, false stories out there of people learning how to walk, allegedly, when all they're doing is doing lower body exercises. And have you seen the exoskeletons? Um, yes, I've seen uh, those devices. Um, and that's one of the, the biggest uh, um, mistakes that people make. You know, they frame it as like, oh, somebody can walk with an exoskeleton. But what would happen if they didn't have that exos exoskeleton? They probably wouldn't be walking. And so I don't believe that um, that's a valid way to say that somebody's walking again. Uh, the technology is good, and I'm grateful it's available, but it's still not walking if we're being truthful about it. Uh, thank you for your being being candid. I appreciate that. Uh, let's see. How has moving from New Jersey to Arizona affected your perspective on disability rights and accessibility? Um, so the reason I moved to Arizona 
um, I've wanted to move here since I was a teenager and I, I went to college uh, in Arizona. Um, so I, I was wanting to move to a warm weather place and there's a big population of, of uh, elderly and disabled in Arizona. So the services in Arizona are overall better than New Jersey. Um, but there are still a lot of issues of mainly financial. I mean, that's a universal problem in America and the financial struggle of being disabled. Um, but other than the services are, are better here, um, I don't notice much of a difference. The financial issues are exist no matter where you live in the U.S. It's true. True. Thank you for that. Let's see. What do you see as the biggest barriers to breaking the cycle of poverty and low education in the disabled community? Um, so I'll start with the low, educa the low education part. That is, um, disabled children should not be automatically put into a disabled school. And then we have to prove that we're, that we're able to be in regular, normal school. It should be the opposite where you should be in regular school. And then if it doesn't work out, then okay, maybe you have to go to uh, a separate school. But what happens is if we're in disabled school first, uh, and uh, we're not learning what we need to learn, it sets us back for our entire education. And then education problems lead to employment problems. Because if you're physically disabled, you're not going to be able to do physical labor for the most part. So that means any way that we can make money when we're disabled has to do with our intellect and our ability to uh, think and have academic knowledge. And so the poor education is directly correlated to, uh, to poor financial status because we're, we're not employed to the level that we need to be. Um, so the education needs to be fixed first, and then the, the, the employment will be fixed as a product of that. Really, really good answer. How do you address the topic of romantic relationships and loneliness in your advocacy work? Um, so right now, I would say I'm actually not actively addressing addressing it, it's on my list of things to address, um, but I'll speak about that topic, how it affects my life. Um, so loneliness, um, in general, I don't feel lonely. Like I'm, I'm, I have people to hang out with, but um, in terms of romantic loneliness, uh, that's, a, that's an issue that I have and that uh, many uh, disabled people have. I, it's uh, not only is it, is it romantic loneliness in terms of like sex? But it's worse than that. It's complete touch deficit where we don't have enough touch. Even even when we were kids, uh, like we were we weren't the type of kids that like oh people wanted to hold or you know people were kind of scared of us because we looked you know kind of fragile or we didn't look like the, like a normal kid at that time. And so we've had touch deficit most of our life. And so it, it uh, of course, when people say romantic loneliness, they're thinking about sex. That is part of it, I'm not gonna lie, but it's actually worse than no sex. It's like no touch at all for most of us. And that uh, only adds to our health problems that we have. Sorry. Um. That I felt because uh, this is not about me, but um, like for the last eight months, like for me, I can't, you know, touch is a, a thing for me. Like I I like to hug and hold hands and I love holding, like being able to hug my kids and my ex-partner. And But when I developed this, I couldn't be touched by the people I loved because it hurt and it caused me to physically hurt and still does. It's not as bad as it used to be, but I, it was something I took for granted for a long time. And uh, having it taken away, 
hurts. It sucks. And like, so I can't relate to what it's like to, you know, have that, uh, you know, your situation. I can't relate to it as a, as a whole, but from the perspective of losing it and knowing what that's like, that void, it sucks. It sucks. I can't, I, I can't imagine what it's like for other people. I mean, cause I only have a short window of, of, of having to experience it, but yeah, that just, that just really hits me. I, I, it's something I would have never thought about ever until going through it. So, wow. Thank you for that. Okay. Uh, what steps do you think society needs to take to reduce exploitation and the abuse of individuals with disabilities? Uh, that's a good question. So I'll start uh, with uh, disabled children. Uh, one of the one of the biggest problems with disabled uh, children and how they're managed is like, for example, let's say I, I, I'm a disabled child. I'm in a wheelchair, and I misbehave or I'm disrespectful in whatever way. Like uh, my wheelchair, it's not like a, it's not like a video game. Something's been taken away. A wheelchair is like my legs. Yeah. So a wheelchair or anybody's mobility device, or if you're autistic, like a like a sensory toy, that's that's not something to uh, to take away as a disciplinary tool. Now people will twist it and they'll say, "Oh well, are you saying disabled kids shouldn't be disciplined?" No, we absolutely should be disciplined. Uh, when, when we get out of line, but our mobility devices are our legs. Uh, so when you take away that, it's actually child abuse, if you ask me. Uh, and the same goes for autistic uh, people getting their sensory toys taken away as their their punishment. Uh, that that's a big issue on the kids side of thing. And then for adults, um, it's more financial. Um, financial issue, uh, whereas we're, uh, some of us work, you know, good quality jobs with smart, some of us have multiple jobs, and we're just not allowed to work um, and have a good, a good life. Uh, that those are two angles of exploitation, but I'm, I'm more worried about the children because for the, for the children, People actually try to justify uh, the type of behaviors I'm describing, like taking away a wheelchair because the kid misbehaved and uh, stuff like that. I'm very disturbed by that type of behavior that is still going on. Great answer, thank you. Looking back on your journey, looking back on your journey so far, what achievement are you most proud of? Um, the, the, what I'm most proud of is my move from New Jersey, where my family grew up, uh, to now I live in Arizona. I live by myself, um, and my parents still live at home. And so I'm, I'm happy that I'm able to be independent and that my, I'm not a, a constant asking my, my parents for uh, assistance. I mean, I'm grateful for them. They're very helpful to me, and they they claim they're happy to help. So I'm grateful. But uh, so it's still nice to give my family and my parents um, freedom that they always uh, desired. I mean, no one ever expects to have uh, disabled children, and they had to adjust uh, my scenario on the fly, um, and they did a great job with that. But it doesn't mean that it's, it's easy. They just did what they felt they had to do. I met your mom a couple of years ago and the very first conversation we ever had, she mentioned how proud she was of you. I mean, so I know for a fact how proud your parents are of you and, uh, you know, you're a hero to your mom, you know, you, uh, they're very, very proud of you. You've done them. And I I'm proud of you and I barely know you, but I, I just, the work that you're doing is remarkable. And, um, it takes courage to do what you're doing. And at the same time, one of the coolest things about what you're doing is that you will, for lack of better word, well, no, I won't use inspire. Wait, 
other people are going, they're going to see this. And the more people that recognize what you're doing, other people are going to go, I want to do that too. You're going to be a celebrity for so many people. They're going to look to you as a role model. They're going to look to you as the source of, again, lack of a better word, inspiration. You're going to help people get off their butt, figuratively, literally, whatever, and start taking action because of the actions that you take every day. Like that's how much influence you have. And the and your influence is going to grow and grow and grow as long as you continue on this path that you're on. A hundred percent, you can count on it. And I know you know that. You don't even need to say it. <laughs> that's my goal. Uh, I know that we're all stronger together. And so I, I want to encourage people to uh, to fight for the uh, for the battles they think are important to their life, and not only important to their life, but important for the generation coming up because. People before us fought for us. People yes. that we never met before fought battles that we don't even know how rough it was. But now we have a better life than they than they had. And so hopefully the same thing will happen for the upcoming disabled generation. We have a lot of work to do, but I'm going to do my part to make sure things are better. Yeah, you're going to. All right, this is your last question. I think we went well over 21 questions. I don't care. Uh, it was worth every bit of it, uh, at least for me anyway. Okay, last question. What's your vision for the future of disability rights and inclusion, and how do you hope to contribute to that vision? Uh, well, an area of inclusion that needs to happen is higher employment uh, rates in my community. and so. My vision is actually not to worry about convincing companies to hire us because you can't convince someone of anything. But if we all figure out how to how to monetize our medical problems and to use what we've learned and to use our suffering um, to make money, um, I think that's where we need to take. That's where we need to go. The direction we need to go in. And we need to create our own, uh, what I call a disability economy, uh, where let's say, let's say somebody uh, needs a wheelchair and I have an extra wheelchair. I need to charge them money for the wheelchair just so we can flow the economy. We're, we're broke. Well, our community is broke. And because we're broke, we don't spend money. And because we don't spend money, we're, we're silent in the economy. And so that's why we're not involved in like politics and other big aspects of society. So we need to fix our financial woes by monetizing our problems and uh, creating our own economy. I'm really happy to, to hear you say that. Um, I, th I don't want to make this about me because uh, I don't, but I need to talk about me for a second. I wrote a book for this exact situation and exactly what you're talking about. And I'm, I want to, I'm going to give it to you. Um, I'm just going to email it to you. It's a workbook. It's a guidebook. It's an interactive book. There's all kinds of stuff in it. And it's all backed by t seven years of research and data from the world economic forum, the United nations. And I mean, many, many other places. And, um, my passion is not just to be a voice for the voiceless, or to elevate the voices for the voiceless, but it's also to equip the voiceless so that they have a voice. And I created a system called the Media Company in a Box. And it essentially is a, a vehicle for people to monetize their gifts, talents, and intellectual property. In fact, protect, I didn't mean to flip you off, protect your intellectual property. So you can monetize your hardship, your breakthroughs, your victories, your gifts, talents, again, intellectual property. And with the tools that are available through technology now and assistive devices and other things, we all have the same opportunity. And so I wanna give you my book because I wanna see your dream come true. And I'm not saying that my book was gonna make your dream come true, but the education that's in it, I think will help you understand and see clearly about this opportunity that you have, because all these things that you talked about and addressed of the problems, I have a solution for. 
And again, I don't want to take credit for it because it came from a vision and a lifetime of a lifetime of work. But at the same time, the reason I created it was for situations like this. And uh, I believe that you have real talent, Philip. And I, I know I said this already, but I told your mom that you have a unique skill set. You are a face, you are a voice for media that transcends the disabled community. Of course, I know you want to help the community, but you're going to help more than that. You're going to help people understand people with disabilities. You're going to help bridge the gap. You're going to help open the doors for the disabled community to start getting those well-paying jobs because of accessibility, inclusivity, and other things that are happening in the fourth industrial revolution. You, my friend, are a forerunner and you're going to change the game for a lot of people all over the world. And I'm absolutely honored to know you. Oh, thank you so much, Joshua. You're a very kind man and you've asked very thoughtful questions. So I very much appreciate that. It's my pleasure. So what I'd like to do now um, is give you the opportunity to share where people can follow your journey, um, where they can work with you, because I know that you coach. Um, but you can share anything you want to share. And if there's something on your heart that you weren't able to get out during this interview, share it. You can share as long as you want. The floor is yours. You get the final word. So anybody that watches uh, this interview, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, you've taken the first step, uh, a step that most other people haven't taken yet, and that is you're interested in learning how to handle disability better. So thank you so much for that. Um, you can follow me on Instagram. I'm Philip Bramwell Coach. That's my first and last name, Philip Bramwell, P-H-I-L-L-I-P. Bramwell, B as boy, R A M as Mary, W E L L, then the word coach, B O A C H. Uh, that's Philip Bramwell Coach on Instagram. And you can email me, Philip Bramwell Coach at gmail.com. Um, I work mostly with the medical, medical schools uh, to train students um, about disability issues through being a patient model, or I can create content uh, on disability issues. I can also do one-on-one -on -one, uh, coaching. Either way, you can contact me through Instagram or through email, and we can get something going.